Um, here you can see the planning committee members. Uh, and I'd like to thank a few other people. First, uh, Dr. Cotman, our dean. He's really spearheaded these efforts to increase awareness of health disparities in our region through this month-long campaign and has continued to emphasize that this is just the beginning. This month is not where we want to end, but a beginning. I'd also like to thank Dr. Uh, Mr. Panton and UHS for supporting the efforts this month, supporting the activities and efforts that you're going to hear about through the presentations today in ways that we are working towards improving health in our community. Numerous people have helped to arrange the various lectures and presentations throughout the course of the month. Denise Blank, Blake from the CME office, Christy Rowe from the Dean's office, have provided overarching support, while each of the department coordinators have helped with individual presentations, including Jennifer Rourke for today's panel. And we appreciate Candy Hodges' help with recording these and making sure that we have these on uh, the website. So to that end, you will be able to get CME for the presentation today if you registered or signed in. You will be getting an email about that. Um, and these presentations will be recorded and available through the website later. None of us have any disclosures related to this. During the planning process, we discussed having a logo or some type of visual representation for this month. And the idea of a word cloud was brought up. This is the current visual representation of what health disparities meant to our team members that replied to our request to name three things that they thought of when they heard the term health disparities. We believe that with increasing awareness, this image may change over time, and we hope that when you complete the evaluation for this panel or request your CME, that you will follow the link to provide your three words. The objectives for tonight include recognizing the barriers to health equity that occur at our institution and within our community, identifying people and organizations in our community working towards health equity, and to be able to discuss key initiatives that the hospital and the graduate school have engaged in for our trainees and our faculty to give opportunities to improve the health of the people of East Tennessee. We have a panel of four outstanding speakers. Our first is new to UT, and I would like to be one of the first to welcome Liliana Gravano as our center's first. If someone on Zoom can give me a thumbs up to let me know that you now can hear me. It's okay now. Okay, great. So, I'm sorry for that. So far you've missed just what you have been able to see on the slides. Welcoming you, thanking those who have made this possible, and looking at our uh, health equity word cloud. Please remember to apply for your CME and contribute to the word cloud in the future. But now I'm going to introduce our first speaker and welcome her officially to UT Medical Center, our first director of community health equity, Liliana Urbano. She officially just took this position the third of this month, but she was actually helping us plan for this evening before she even started her job here. She's a Columbia native and has extensive public health experience, both locally and internationally. Most recently, she spent 11 years with the Knox County Health Department in various roles. Please help me welcome Liliana. Good evening, everyone. everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. As Dr. Sainz said, today is my 14th day in the job, so I'm going to present very general information in regards to social determinants of health, health inequities, and um, health disparities. don't start a presentation with a quote, but I think this quote actually presents really well what has been happening in terms of healthcare uh, services in the community and in the country since probably the last 10 years with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. When I is replaced with we, even illness becomes wellness. And when I refer to we, 
I mean the community. And there are so many different ways that we can understand the community. For many, the community could be our service area, which is 21 counties. It could be a county, it could be a city, it could be a census tract, a zip code. But I would like to start by presenting some data that you can easily find in the CDC places. And this is very interesting data that allows you to understand what are the health outcomes in our region. And this is just a snapshot of the 21 county service area for UT Medical Center. And as you can see, there are very striking disparities or differences. And this is just four examples of health outcomes. Here we have high blood pressure, mental health, heart disease, and obesity. But you can start getting an idea of how different our counties in this region perform. But the same happens with health screening practices. You can start looking at the differences, particularly in those counties that are more marginalized or rural areas. And you can see the results in regards to mammography, cervical cancer screening, dental visits, colorectal cancer, and blood pressure monitoring. And finally, exactly the same happens when we talk about unhealthy behaviors. And this is just uh, four examples regarding physical inactivity, binge drinking, sleeping less than seven hours, and current smoking. So here you can have a pretty good idea of how health outcomes are different throughout an entire region. So the first thing that we see are differences in health outcomes, right? And I would like to introduce the first concept that I will be using throughout this presentation. And for the purpose of this presentation, I will be using the framework developed by the Rotary with Johnson Foundation. So health disparities or health inequities, both terms can be used interchangeably, are possibly avoidable systemic health differences adversely affecting economically or socially disadvantaged groups. And you can see how that applies to the snapshots that I just showed you. Health disparities or inequities are shown are how we measure progress towards health equity. So health equity is our final goal, but the only way that we have at this point to measure the advancement on social um, and health equity is measuring if we reduce or not the disparities in the community. So now that we introduce the concept of health equity, this is defined as health equity means that everyone, everyone, has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And now we ask the question, what really affects health, right? And when you look at this framework developed by the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, you realize that 80% of the factors are non-clinical factors, right? So we have 30% are attributed to health behaviors, 10% to physical environment, 20%, only 20% to clinical care, and 40% socioeconomic factors. And those are basically education, employment, income, family and social support, and community safety, right? So working on addressing health disparities and reaching out or trying to achieve health equity means that we are working on removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness, the lack of access to good jobs, and this is very important, it's not just jobs, it's good jobs with um, fair pay, quality of education, not any type of education, high quality education from kindergarten, um, and housing, quality housing, safe environments, and healthcare, of course. So that definition of those elements bring us to the final concept that I want to introduce here, and those are the social determinants of health. And if you see the definition, it is basically non-medical factors. And this is very important because sometimes we think, well, why are we talking about that? Those are not medical um, factors such as employment, income, housing, transportation, childcare, education, discrimination, and the quality of the places where people live, work, learn, and play, which influence health. And that's the very reason why we are talking about social determinants of health. Here you have a more detailed description of what do we mean when we talk about this social determinants of health. When we talk about economic stability, we are talking about employment, income, expenses, etc. When we talk about food, we are talking about hunger, but also the access to healthy options. 
When we talk about education, we are talking about literacy, language, etc. And here you see on and on different factors that contribute to the health of our patients. So initially I show you a snapshot of how the community or the service area for UT Medical Center looks like. But now I would like to bring down some examples on how inequities can look at the county level. So for those of you familiar or from Knoxville or not, this is our map. And here you can see clearly some disparities, right? And I'm talking about disparities in life expectancy. Who of you are here from Knoxville? Who are native from Knoxville or familiar with this map? So, okay. I'm going to make some introductions of this data. So here you can see the wealthiest areas in town. And here you can see the more economically challenged areas of town. The difference between these two areas is 20 years in life expectancy, right? And this brings us to start thinking why that happens. What are the different factors? Why are we getting people living 66 years while others live 86? So let's think about more specific health outcomes. Let's talk about obesity, right? And we have basically the same map over and over. We are getting those health outcomes in the same areas. And why is this important to know? Is basically is because when you look at the general data, and you have it here, where it says 32.6 of Knoxville adults report being obese compared to the average 30.4 across the dashboard. Here you see a small difference between the 700 and 50 cities included in the city dashboard, but it's probably not that significant. But when you look at a specific census tract within Knox County, you can see that, well, the city as a whole has 32.6%. There are zip codes that have almost 50% of their population with obesity, right? This should spark some kind of questions. Why is this happening? And probably it's not because all the people with health conditions are living just together. It's because there are some policies and systems in place that have created this. And why is this important to know and how that relates with social determinants of health? So when you learn about someone who has a diabetes or obesity, you also should understand what is the context, what is the neighborhood and the community that embraces this person. So if you compare the information that we have before on obesity and you contrast it with the access to healthy foods, you realize that people in our community are struggling. So when someone is diagnosed with diabetes and the only prescription that we have is eat better food or healthier food, we need to understand that probably there is not a grocery store in their neighborhood, that they don't have access to healthy food, right? So this is extremely important to understand and that's why screening for this kind of factors and community needs is very important from the hospital perspective, perspective as well as the community perspective. So now you might be asking, what can I do, right? It feels like this is so beyond the hospital um, capacity, but there are so many things that you can do. First, you can educate yourself on the local data and what are the social determinants of health that we see here at the hospital. Secondly, you can also be proactive in collecting data or understanding what are the options to collect data that help us understand about the social needs of our patients as well as the social determinants of health. But finally, you can also apply this framework to your research. If you are planning on developing some research, make sure that you are addressing health disparities, health inequities, and social determinants of health. Thank you. Our next speaker is well known to most of you, Dr. Keith Gray is the Chief Medical Officer and the Surgical Oncologist here at UTMC. Dr. Gray has a particular interest in eliminating health disparities and does this through being a physician, teacher, mentor, leader within our hospital, and an active member of the community. And again, the full bios are going to be available on the websites. Good evening to everyone. I'm actually going to start with a story. Um, 
So I've, I've always had an interest in health disparities. Um, I grew up in East North Carolina, a town not part, an area not too dissimilar from here. The demographics are different, but the, the social determinants of health, as was just outlined to us, are very similar. And so once I decided that I want to be a physician, my, my ultimate goal was to serve the people of my community to help eliminate some of those disparities, a lot of which existed in my own family. And so that followed me to, you know, throughout my training. And for the longest time, disparities were linked with, with race, race and ethnicity. So said another way, it was pretty discouraging because if you were a person of color, then you didn't, you didn't have a chance from a health and outcome standpoint. You weren't, you weren't going to live as many years, you weren't likely to be obese. Uh, you were more likely to be under, under, uneducated, so on and so forth. But uh, the World Health Organization introduced social determinants of health in 2010-ish. And what it did more than anything is it, it, it took our focus off just race and ethnicity, but it also gave us, gave us hope, gave us things that we could work on. However, we went another 10 years or so talking about the differences, that the differences exist, existed. And we call those health disparities between any demographic, whether it's racial, ethnic, uh, socioeconomic, geographic, uh, gender related, those are the gaps. But the question I kept asking is what are we going to do about it? To your, to your last, or your next to the last slide. And that, that is why I start with the term health equity and not health disparities. It says that people have a right to be healthy, um, people should have an equal opportunity to, to achieve their best health. Doesn't say that everybody will, we know that everyone won't, but they won't, they should have an equal opportunity to do so. So I want to go back about eight years. I was in the community in 2014. I was asked to give a talk on disparities in cancer care. Um, I was asked to come to the Beck Cultural Center, and I was embarrassed to say, as an African American in this town, I didn't know where that was. And so my assistant printed out a map for me to get to the Beck. And so I'm giving my talk. It was about this time in the evening. And so at the conclusion, I said, basically, if you eat healthy food, fresh fruits and fresh vegetables, and you exercise, two thirds of cancer will go away. And so about two or three hands went up in the audience. And they said, where are we supposed to get those fresh fruits and vegetables in our neighborhood? And I said, what do you mean? Well, this is Knoxville, Tennessee. And they said, another hand went up and they said, where are, you supposed, where are we supposed to exercise? Our streetlights aren't operating correctly. Or we don't have light at night and we're afraid to walk through our own neighborhood. And I said out loud, I don't believe you. And so I spent the next several years driving some of these zip codes that you just talked about, 37921, since it's track 14, which is Lonsdale, and others investigating and seeing firsthand what health disparities really meant. And now why it's important to me is because once you see some of these things, you can't unsee them. You then see the people that belong to these statistics and numbers, and it motivates you to strive toward health equity. And lastly, this, this slide is from Robert Johnson, and, uh, our executive director for diversity, equity, and inclusion, Becky Fogarty, uh, put this slide together. But it says you can't have the prescri same prescription for everyone to achieve health equity. You've got to understand the unique needs of these zip codes and the system track, and then be intentional about putting a, a prescription or a plan together to achieve health equity. So this is a Knox County Commun Community uh, Needs Index. And this can be known for any zip code in the country. We can put one together for our entire uh, catchment area. But I think, again, being intentional, starting small, it's pretty hard to focus on the health disparity and the health needs of 21 counties. So for me, it became what can we do here in our own community? And part of that is understanding where the disparities exist. A lot of the folks in this room are physicians, and what we do is a person comes to us with an illness, and we target that illness. That, in turn, makes the entire body healthier. We don't look at the whole body of the things that are working well. We go to the things that are not working well. So these red areas are the places areas that aren't working well for whatever reason. So the, the Community Needs Index is, is, a, is a, uh, a composite score, if you will, that is composed of income, culture, language, education, housing status, and insurance coverage. And those scores are uh, uh, combined to give you a Community Needs Index score. So one says you're at lowest risk for having health needs in your, in your area or zip code. And five says you're at the greatest risk of having health needs in your area or zip code. And as you can see, that 37921 that Liliana put up before is a 4.4 significantly. There's a five, which is East Knoxville, 37915. And there's a, there's a lot of four pluses uh, on that list. And so a lot of the efforts that are occurring on this campus in Knox County 
are focused in those areas, and I just want to talk about a few of those uh, this evening. Uh, uh, and this, these are not my efforts, these are efforts that are, are occurring already in our organization. So we are a regional perinatal center, we're one of five uh, in Tennessee, and there are some efforts already that are being focused in some of these areas, specifically 37915, uh, to address uh, mater maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. This is just an example. This is a, a partnership or match grant or grant from City Match uh, with our perinatal center that will be used to address that maternal and fetal morbidity mortality in some of, uh, some of our most impoverished areas. Those initiatives were st supposed to start two years ago, but we have this little thing called COVID that postponed everything in the world. But we have some of those planned for um, early spring of this year. So Dr. White didn't pay me to put this slide in here, but this is this is something that is near and dear to his heart. Uh, his group has creates access for urologic care throughout our 21 county uh, catchment area. He's uh, passionate about this, passionate about this, providing education, awareness, access to care. He provides his group rather provides more indigent care than any other urologic group uh, in the city. He has also uh, formed partnerships with people like Graham and Surgery on Sunday to provide even more uh, urologic access uh, to the people of East Tennessee. This is an initiative that we got involved in two years ago. This is, this is not something we went looking for, but Dr. Tom Kim, for those of you that know him, ran this clinic, this space, uh, since 2005. He's been running the After Hours Free Medical Clinic since 1993. He retired, he's a graduate of ours, and he said, would you guys keep this open? And so we've been uh, shepherding, really, this clinic for the last two years and providing <coughs> financial resources, human resources, it has become a place for our residents to rotate. We currently have internal medicines, residents rotating there, and our family practice uh, residents rotating there as well, with the vision of having surgical residents there. But it provides care for the working uninsured, um, age 19 plus, and most recently, we spent last year raising money right over that area where it says Free Medical Clinic of America with the, with the lines, which are no longer there. That has been turned into a dental clinic, two dental operatories. And so it is one of the few places that provides dental care. Actually, it's the only place in Knox County that provides dental care for the uninsured where you don't already have to have a primary care relationship. Interfaith is different than that you have to have a relationship on the, on the primary care side, but here it's for all comers of, uh, that are uninsured and working. This is our presence. I put this here to say our presence in the community. So once you know where the areas are, uh, once you know where some, what some of the needs are, you can't just rush into the community and start doing things. You have to have the trust of the community. So this slide probably should say trust. And so being in the community uh, for the last eight years or so, we had that trust with some of the most vulnerable areas when the pandemic hit. And so going back to the equity slide, you know, not everybody got the same size bike. We opened up a vaccine clinic here, but we didn't make the assumption that everyone could come to our vaccine clinic. Not everyone could, not everyone did. But for the people that couldn't or wouldn't, uh, for whatever reason, we partnered with them in their own community with leaders, recognized leaders in their community, i.e. through the churches, um, to deliver vac vaccines in those uh, at-risk communities. 37921 was one of the zip codes, 37915 uh, was the other. But we partnered, uh, administered vaccines in their churches, used their nurses. This is Kaya Defied in the left lower quadrant. This is a African-American nursing uh, sorority, the oldest in the country. Um, again, people that they trusted to administer a vaccine that, that remains uh, very controversial and has some successful outcomes. And Liliana was still at the health department at the time. She'll tell you some of the data that we experienced here in Knox County was not experienced really anywhere else in the country. We didn't have the same disparities in the number of people or percentage of people vaccinated or the mortality associated with COVID that other communities experienced in the country. As a matter of fact, I think our uh, Latino Latinx community was the most vaccinated. 68.5%. Um, 68.5%. And I think Knox County at large is still in the 50s, mid 50s, 55, 50, 52%. This is another initiative uh, launched about the same time as a free medical clinic. So this is Lonsdale, this is 375921, this is the census track 14 that she showed earlier. And so the question is again, what are the barriers that exist for having access to care? Um, this was a, so behind this where it says health center is a sports facility. And it's an indoor basketball courts, the free soccer fields, there's, there's a gym, there's a worship arts center. And we said, 
people always gather to, to watch their kids do whatever. And we said, why don't we put a clinic there so while the kids are doing whatever, the parents can have access to health care. Uh, so we opened this clinic in partnership with Cherokee Health two years ago to address those primary care needs. They see about 4,000 encounters per year over the last year despite COVID. They offer uh, mental health, and there is a, there's vision and planning. I've been working with Bruce Hartman to expand this clinic and offer dental services and access to uh, specialty care. But at the center of that decision making is the leaders of the community. We're not doing anything without their permission or their insight. And last, the last thing I'll say is, again, strategic partnerships are important when you're trying to achieve health equity. We can't, we can't do it all because we don't know it all. There are people that are already in the community that are working and hard on these initiatives and passionate about it. And so we're, we're in the process now of understanding who's doing what in our own roles, but also in the community. And this is just a brief partnership with, with UTK and their MPH program. We had students that donated 90 hours of service uh, to us. And what they worked on was basically putting get together that roster of, of uh, health offering um, organizations in our community, where they're located, what, what insurances they take, so on and so forth. So now, as we move out into the community, what we don't want to do is, do is duplicate services, but now we know where we can form partnerships and we can also identify where the gaps are as we try to uh, achieve health equity. Thank you. Our third speaker is Kay Ragnar, Ragnar. Kay was born in India and immigrated to the United States about 40 years ago. She's a dentist by training, but also earned degrees in health informatics and healthcare management, and we're lucky enough to have her putting those skills to use as our director in the internal medicine and OBGYN resident clinic here at UTGSM. She embraces diversity and inclusion in the clinical setting and in volunteering in the community, and she completed UT Health Science Center's diversity certificate program. Hi, thank you uh, so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm the director of the UT Internal Medicine and the OBG1 Health Clinic. It's our graduate school of medicine it's residency clinic or resident clinic. Um, I have, um, that's our mission statement, which is as a part of the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, College of Medicine, the UT Graduate School of Medicine strives to meet the needs of our community, our region, and our state through healing, education, and discovery. Um, So our OBGYN clinic is staffed with 18 board certified uh, OBGYNs. We have three women's uh, health nurse practitioners, and we have 16 resident physicians um, dedicated to serving in the primary care setting. Um, a resident physician under the supervision and guidance of an academic <coughs> physician sees these patients. Um, we provide the following services, primary care, OBGYN, uh, we have a contraceptive clinic on Monday mornings, <laughs> led by Dr. Zai. Um, we have a coposcopy clinic every other Friday morning. We do have a pelvic pain clinic every second Friday of the week of the month. We also have high-risk OB clinic where our uh, high-risk doctors come down to our clinic and um, supervise that high-risk clinic. The patients are from our own clinic. Uh, we also have, we received a March of Times grant about three years ago, and um, we conduct supportive pregnancy groups uh, until COVID happened, and now we are doing virtual um, and telehealth clinics for them. Uh, we also do virtual education classes monthly via Zoom, and then we have breastfeeding consultations. Um, our internal medicine clinic, on the other hand, has 10 board certified internists and 37 resident physicians who serve the cares of uh, 
primary care needs of the community. The following are the services we provide, which is of course our residents are PCPs for many of the patients who come into the clinic. Uh, we do annual physicals and medical wellness exams. Uh, we have a dermatology clinic on Monday afternoons. Um, we have a psychiatrist in-house who does clinic every day of the week, half a day, and then has a resident clinic on Fridays. Uh, we also have a hospital follow-up clinic three times a week. And it's called the REACT clinic, which, is, which stands for Rapid Evaluation and Care, care Transition. We also have a PRN clinic where we take same day appointments for acute issues or call-ins. This we try to prevent the ER visits or readmissions of our patients. Um, just a little um, a summary of the rapid evaluation and care transition clinic. And this is uh, hospitalization and after is very confusing and overwhelming for many, many patients with new diagnosis unfamiliar terminologies and multiple medication changes. So what we do is during discharge in the hospital itself, our residents go ahead and make an appointment for them to be seen in the clinic. So here, and then the resident doctor goes ahead and makes a phone call to these patients who are discharged within 24 to 48 hours. This helps them take a good history, they make sure that the discharge process has taken place well. The patient knows what kind of medications to take after they have come home. They know, um, they ask them about how their living conditions are. They also make them an appointment to come back into the clinic within 7 to 14 days. This is our transition care management. Um, most of the patients who we see for hospital follow-ups do not really have insurance or a PCP. Most of the time they do not have PCP. Most times we establish them in the clinic, assist them with applying for insurance, and help them with any of the healthcare needs. I just wanted to give you all a clinic uh, snapshot for last year, the number of clinics we've had um, on our OBG client side and the internal medicine clinic side and the number of REACT patients we have seen every day. Uh, it's the same number of clinics. I think there is a little time when uh, the total number of clinic days. But we do see a lot of patients. We see patients for all, every need they have. And um, I'm just very proud to be the director of this clinic, to tell you the truth. Um, it's just wonderful, the staff we have, the residents we have, the doctors we have, the way they manage these patients. Um, this is our patient population. On internal medicine side, we have about 45, that's the average of last year, about 45% Medicare and managed care. <clears throat> Ten care is about 31%. Um, on internal medicine side, we do see um, more commercial patients also, and um, some self-based and um, some no insurance patients. Uh, on the OBGYN side, as you can see the difference, we see about 84% of dental care patients. Um, we have patients ranging from 13 year olds to, you know, to GYN patients who are over the age of 60. <clears throat> um, we also have uh, a not agreements, but contracts with some of the clinics in town, um, like the Kappa Clinic, Interfaith Clinic, Health Department, where we get patients um, coming in for contraceptive mainly, and um, you know, colposcopy. Health Department patients have a lot of uh, patients in the colposcopy clinic. Um, and then we also help them to make sure if they're going to get in some kind of insurance, say if they're pregnant, and we help them um, try to get some kind of help when they're pregnant also. Um, we've talked about this again and again, the barriers and the barriers to access to healthcare. And what I see in the clinic are some of these. Um, I started in 2017, and then um, in 2017, the approximate no-show rate in our clinic was about 
45% in the OBGYN clinic and 34% in internal medicine. And um, many reasons, many of the reasons you all know why this could happen. Patients don't have um, transportation. The buses that they take come in at 8 a.m. in the morning and their appointment is two, at 2 o'clock. Patients don't have child care. They have other kids at home and a little baby. So um, parking is a problem. It used to be $1. Now it is $3. Like the $3 can bring them in. Why, why would they pay for parking, right? Where they stay, the conditions of where they stay, stay the unhygienic conditions. So all this took, uh, took part in why these patients were not showing up or why there were cancellations. And um, we had a green project going about three, uh, three years ago under the guidance of Dr. Vanessa. And uh, we figured out all this and we placed some schemes in place so we could have these patients come. And um, I know I get emotional when I talk about this. And I just checked my no-show rate for 20 Even with COVID, even with COVID, my no-show rate for OBGYN now is 14%. One four, 14%. And even in medicine was 9%. That's just amazing. You know, and um, I don't know if you all noticed, even with COVID, the number of office visits we did, I had never hit an office visit per month more than 900 in OBG Miami. Now I'm at 1,012. But that's a 200 patient, patient office visits, you know. Um, so what are the things we have put in place? Um, some, most of the patients are also referred to the free clinics Dr. Gray was talking about. We also see some of our patients in another free clinic, uh, which Dr. Perky, Dr. Janet Perky goes to. Uh, she is um, the free clinic on Methodist on Magnolia. It's a church where she has her free clinic uh, on Methodist. Uh, also, some uh, agreements uh, to see some of our patients who are with COPPA, with Interfaith. We see those open arm patients for Medicare wellness exams. Um, we have um, been giving handouts and flyers with information regarding transportation. Uh, we have had appointment cards printed with all the payers on the back of the card. Um, I want to show that. Uh, just like that. Those are flyers we give to the patients. We have those posted in the clinic. We have them on a PowerPoint presentation in the, in the waiting area. And um, those four numbers from the payers of Tencare, we give, when the patient gets the appointment card, we give those to them. And all this has helped patients to actually have transportation and come in, you know. Um, we have seen a couple of plans um, last year and before that. So we have also um, bought some parking passes uh, for patients who cannot afford to park, especially those patients who come in every week. We make sure they have parking passes. Uh, there is an unofficial gift fund where some of my doctors give me some cash and I buy parking passes. I buy food for these patients. Um, sometimes they come in in the morning on an extra bus and stay for an afternoon um, appointment. Um, with the UNC plan, telehealth plan we received last year, we also um, started getting bags with goodies like a blood pressure instrument, a weighing scale, uh, a thermometer, uh, a handheld doctor. All these go in a diaper bag for the patients. And if they don't need to be seen in the office, we give it to them and we ask them to do the, take the blood pressure, take their vitals, and we do a telehealth. Uh, visit. Uh, we also have coordinators from Denkhead coming in um, diff at different times of an OB clinic where they come in and stay. These are their coordinators and they help the patients with a lot of uh, different things, getting formula for the baby or something like that. And of course, our team of nurse practitioners, LPNs, and other staff, we follow up by doing phone calls. And 
ideas on that. Anyway, I just want to conclude that patient education is a very important role we play in our clinic. Handouts are very important. Um, when there's a medication change, a new problem, any kind of changes, when a handout is given, we have to realize that the patient can do what they need to do. So, um, anyway, I know that EMR, there's a lot of check boxes and in the eyes, dots for the eyes and T's to cross, but uh, it has taken only a little patient care, I think. Um, but I think we're doing a wonderful job. So please come visit. We just did a very nice renovation of the clinic. I meant to put a picture of the new clinic as a renovation, uh, but I forgot the last minute. But thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. the Dean of our GSM, and as the Director of Health Policy at the Howard Baker Center for Public Policy at UTK. Dr. Cottle is also currently serving is the, uh, on the American College of OBGYN Underserved Women's Committee and the Committee for the American Cancer Society Cervical Cancer Screening Initiative. Dr. Cottle. Thank you. So you advance somewhere. Yeah, right. So when I uh, came to Cherokee, I was from the Baker Center and I studied health policy at 40,000 feet. So I moved in to this office here, just advancing on the back. I moved into this office here. What's happening? So I moved into this office, and this is the building across the, the intercity that is in the seat 37921 zip code. Right up against the projects, uh, with the only exception to the food desert, the food city across the street. So I came from 40,000 feet down to the level where I actually saw these patients and have seen them five days a week for 10 years. And I have learned so much about what disparities and underserved means during that time. This is inside of our building. It's a beautiful building. It was built with a donation from the city for the land and a 1% loan. <clears throat> now, what our community health centers are federally qualified health centers. They were, they were established in the 70s uh, based on patients' need uh, rather than ability to pay. Uh, and, and we're were to be as comprehensive as possible and run by local, local community boards, which is what we have. There are over 1,100 in Tennessee, and we see 25 million people a year in this country, and Sheridan Health Systems itself has over 20 sites in Tennessee. We have sites in Memphis, we have a bunch of ground here, we have East Tennessee. The U.S. population is 33% identified as belonging to a racial or ethnic minority. 51% are women. We in Cherokee have seen a, a dramatic influx in this population. 12% have a disability. 70 million live in rural areas, which is something somebody mentioned is the disparities in rural areas. And 4% are LGBT. These are, these are well-established facts. Now, in my clinic, I've seen people from these places, uh, including Central America, uh, Africa, Afghanistan, Eastern Europe. And it's fascinating to talk to these people. I've never talked to a person before who grew up at a refugee plant, camp in Africa before they matriculated to the United States after years in that camp. I've never talked to a, a Mexican woman who lived in a community where you only held hands until you got married. Um, it's been a, a learning experience. It's been fascinating. Now, Cherokee is the site for the bridge program, which is the legal immigration program for, patient, for people that come into this community by the, the immigration service. So we get these patients. 
they see primary care physicians, they get their immunizations, they get their uh, testing for things like TB, and are on ten care for a year. This is an example of one of our clinics. This is the Talbot Clinic where uh, this is a postpartum group visit. You can, uh, you can see that um, we have a lot of babies that you've delivered here. This has been a great cooperation with the UT Medical Center, which has done all the deliveries, all the human oncology, all the, <clears throat> um, all the OB work. Our staff has registered nurses, medical assistants, interpreters in person, bilingual staff, psychologists, social services there, and pediatrician addiction access. Pediatricians work with me in that building. This is our office, one of the lab sites. Uh, so as, as I said, health disparities are significant differences in health status and outcomes based on different groups of people, which includes race, ethnicity, immigration status, disability, sex, sexual orientation, geography, and income. For example, maternal mortality varies by state and accounts it's counted more by social, more than medical and geographic factors. There is a strong racial disparity affecting non-Hispanic blacks. Still, there is disparities in cervical cancer rates, breast cancer, survival, diabetes care, COVID outcomes. Almost everywhere you look, there are health disparities based on uh, really who you are and where you are. The barriers include poverty, the cost, the lack of insurance, but it's not just uh, money. There's language barriers, uh, mental illness, race, substance misuse, physical abuse. Um, we've had, for example, patients that speak Spanish that had private insurance that couldn't get their surgeries over here because people presumed they hadn't filled out the forms. They didn't need to fill out a ten care form. Um, and we've had uh, significant communication problems with mentally ill people in various services uh, with a lack of, of treatment and understanding. The barriers to access are one reason for health disparities, but not all of them. There's multiple reasons, including a lack of diversity in our workforce, a lack of insurance in certain populations, such as immigrants and genetics and culture. We see a lot of cultural impact over in Cherokee, where people will use home remedies. Um, I've seen people drinking tea instead of taking their metformin because that's, that's what they grew up with. Um, so there's multiple reasons for these disparities. Um, now, um, I'm on the ACOG committee for uh, underserved women, and they don't miss any words about how they feel about this issue. Structural racism is a system in which public policies and institutional policies and cultural representations and other norms work in various ways to perpetuate <coughs> racial root inequity. And there's an implicit bias in providers, the attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner still impact the way we deliver patient care. So what are the practical tools? Screen for social determinants of health care. Our patients complete a questionnaire before we see them. They actually also uh, uh, do a PHQ-9 on their cell phone that's registered in my EHR before I see them. That's the impression screen. All, everybody does that sitting in, sitting in the uh, lobby or on the way over there on their cell phone. Uh, so inquire about the social determinants of health, such as food, safe water, utility, safety, employment conditions, transportation. Um, I have, for example, patients that hear gunfire and have to huddle their uh, children in the bathroom until it stops. I have patients whose kids can't play outside because of the, the risk of getting shot by stray bullets. Um, we need to maximize the referrals of social services I've had have social services move people that were threatened, you know, in the projects. Um, we need interpreter services that are in person. It's been well documented. The language line is not near as good as in-person interpreters. You can't have them for everything, but certainly for, for Spanish. Um, and and uh, our national committee says we need to acknowledge that racial discrimination is a determinant of health and that we need 
policy changes and we need more light color providers. This is a, an example, too, of the fact that Cherokee is an integrated mental health center. Here I am talking to the psychologist on, on my right and a caseworker on the left. So when we have somebody that has an elevated PHQ-9 or Edinburgh 10 or higher, we immediately have a, psych a psychologist, a behavioral health person, come and see them. Uh, we have people with, that uh, threat suicide. We have some people that we even have to uh, commit. Um, but we have a behavioral health consultant there with us, and we have access to a psychiatrist on the phone or through telehealth. So the solutions to us is the healthcare workforce reflects the diversity of the United States. I, I remember asking the OB residents a few years ago, how many, how many Hispanic medical students do you see? I don't know, do you have any in the class now, do you? Um, the community health centers and systems treat 25 million and they want to double that in 10 years. Uh, they have unique support in going to implement competent health promotion and disease prevention programs. So when people come in here and have their leg amputated because they don't have diabetes, or they're seeing the ER three or four times for threat miscarriage, that all adds up and we all pay for that. If you just look at the finances of this thing. <clears throat> With our tax money, we are all paying for the fact that we do not treat this stuff until it's downstream. Healthcare is inextricably linked to social conditions, and health disparities are. And this is this is not me. This is our committee says that health disparities are principally due to structural racism and implicit bias. So I know that the governor of Florida says that, that roads aren't racist. But look at where they're built. Look at what's on my side of the interstate versus over here. Uh, there's a lot of this stuff that is implicit and a lot of it is subconscious. So we have to always fight to overcome this, even within ourselves, you know, and, and create a more equitable society. Uh, because as every first speaker said, everybody deserves a chance to help people out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I really appreciate that our speakers gave some solutions. I think that sometimes when we talk about this, we just point out the issues, but we do have some concrete things that we could work on. I want to respect everyone's time, so I understand if you um, need to leave at the hour up or our Zoom folks are leaving, but we do have some time for questions, and I think our panelists would um, stay a little bit late for questions or for discussion, which we were hoping would be uh, part of the evening. So uh, if you want to zoom in a question in the chat, I will take a look at it. Uh, and if you are here and have a question, our panelists would love to uh, field those questions. So traditionally, like I said, that our clinic has been uh, open to the working uninsured, but to your point, the access we don't care for uninsured and uninsured in Austin is very, very um, scarce. The, the health department traditionally for adults has just provided emergency dental care. And as I said, um, Interfaith provides dental care for patients that are members of their primary care um, panel, if you will. So we haven't. Uh, taking so far, taking patients with ten care, but I, I'm open to that discussion. I mean, we got two chairs right now. The, the barrier is a dentist that can provide three-hour, you know, 
uh, we serve, which right now our name is only about eight hours of care per week. Um, but yeah, we can have that discussion online and we'll be willing to, willing to consider that. Especially for our organization, for sure. Yes. There is another resource in the community that probably you already know about is the Western Heights Dentistry. It's in census tract 14 and they, I will say probably most of their clients are in care or uninsured. So that will be something that I can share with you early right. tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and I was just made aware that in April, when all postpartum women are given one year of postpartum coverage, that coverage will include dental coverage which will create an, a very big additional need, and TenCare is creating a network of dental providers that will be willing to see these people, supposedly in a reasonable um, mileage radius, so that may help other TenCare recipients to find out where there's more access as well. Well, that, that's actually a really nice segue to my question. Uh, starting with uh, Katie's uh, presentation, showing what tent care can do in terms of facilitating transportation. I was wondering also if maybe Dr. Caudill could comment on his view of tent care and their programmatic creativity, if you will, in facilitating access to care. And what more can be done there? Well, the majority of people that are on tent care are women and children. So, we have a huge number of people that are on, not on either, uh, and they have no access to anywhere. Uh, but but us, because FQAC takes, takes people with, with that are uninsured, that have nothing, uh, you know, on a come as you can basis. Um, regarding transportation, I've had a patient this week that just got out of jail as she was 11 weeks pregnant, and she could not, she could not get transportation home. Our case worker took her home. But in general, we give out bus passes. Um, we, we are not ever communicated with by 10 here um, at, that, at our level. Um, I don't know of 10 care programs to provide transportation. Who does? Do they? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I think they yeah. so that's the OB patients. Everybody else which is virtually everybody that we see outside of the OB clinic, um, you know, doesn't have it, and it's a huge problem. The other thing I'll say is we don't exclude people from bringing their children to the business because they can't, they can't come if you do that. Um, many of our immigrant patients do not have driver's licenses. They don't have car insurance, they don't own the cars that they're driving. So every time they get out, they are at risk of an accident. We've had people intimidated in our parking lot for having a minor fender bender, where they were told that they were calling the police if they didn't get a large amount of cash. Um, I live in a different world up there than, oh, than I had over here. But it's been fascinating to see. Um, and so, to me, I think that advocacy should be for a social policy for 10 care for more people, particularly the non pregnant people, like other states have done, such as California, to where we can expand 10 care. And I know Governor Hassan tried to do that when he was the governor. Um, it'd be a win win for everybody because of the upstream treatment of a lot of things. Uh, and I think that really opened us up. So I think we need to continue to advocate. Yeah, for and I would say that as well as advocate, communicate, because the stuff you mentioned, TenCare does pay for transportation for other people, just you have to be aware of it yeah. and access it. Yeah. We just learned that TenCare is paying for um, two postpartum visits outside the right. global of pregnancy, yeah. but they, didn't, they don't communicate directly to the providers. They ask right. their NCOs to communicate, and what's the motivation for the NCOs to tell us that they're going to give us more money? So we have to change that policy as well. Someone else has to be able to inform us of these the things. The other thing is that cover his pace and coverage is different than regular tenure. And a lot of it is very minimal and may not cover transportation. Maybe. And uh, so we have a lot of problems with that. Uh, 
those phone numbers on the back of the appointment cards are for everyone. Not just for, for pregnant people. So we call the care coordinators or the um, for each of the payers and we ask them and they are the months. So it's proven and our patients do call them on both internal medicine and yeah. OB. We have to like have to enter the room. Well, the room is all people don't have. That's true. Yeah. Um, and then on the um, Zoom, Dr. Belak pointed out that uh, Interfaith has dental services, and it was pointed out that RAM has their dental clinics that are not all the time, but we can watch out for that and try to engage our patient in that. Um, that it's, there's comments on the Zoom that community policy and expansion of public transportation will also be excellent. The other thing, they're going to shoot me for saying this, but we have a dental clinic in Lanerville that takes, takes adults. That's up Highway 33. And that's without insurance or anything. So everything we do is not dependent on whether you have even attend care. Hello, I'm Callie McAdams. I'm a one of our PGY4 surgical residents. And my question is um, a lot of times we get to see these patients kind of at the end of the road and something has gone terribly bad. Um, where do we fit in in terms of clinics in helping patients out? I can think off the top of my head that I'd be happy to give up one of my days to do wound care for these patients, or particularly with those patients when they get out of the hospital for your clinic, um, troubleshooting surgical problems and post-surgical care with these patients that get out of the hospital. So where do you think that we could fit into your part? That's a really interesting suggestion. I think we could troubleshoot or brainstorm some of that for some stuff in our clinic setting that residents outside of internal medicine and OBGYN may be able to provide some services. Dr. Gray did mention um, Surgery on Sunday, which is a group that's working to be created. That would be another way that surgery residents could try to help people before they're at that desperate time. We could, I mean, we, we obviously have uh, residents rotating at the medical clinic, the UFP residents and also internal medicine group surgery residents as well, we can coordinate that out. Yes. Smadar and I were working together pre-COVID on that, and then obviously that fell off the cliff, but we can resurrect that. that. That's a great idea. I would be happy in any way to help with that. Absolutely, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm Rusty McGillett, um, internist as well as integrated medicine physician. I wanted to ask a question about the information that the public health students got together for what are all of the healthcare opportunities in the community, but also to say, how can we work with existing foundations? For instance, the East Tennessee Foundation is really focusing on health, well, on disparities, on racism, but health is one of those foci. How can we work with them? They are very interested in how they can get the people that are giving money and donating to see these disparities and how we can influence that. So how would you see us working with them? Our community. That's a great question, Rocio, that I will not have an answer after my 14 days at work. But we do understand that there's so many organizations already doing work related to health equity. The issue is that everybody's working in silos. So the first thing that we need to do is identify who is doing what and what are the gaps and start connecting. And probably that's something that we should do from UT Medical Center, kind of like convene all these organizations, at least starting in Knox County, to have a better understanding, to create some synergy around health equity. I think that that's probably one of the biggest issues that I have seen here in Knox County is everybody does their own thing in isolation and I think we could have so much momentum and synergy around this issue. The other thing that I wanted to connect with that in regards to what Dr. Hoffman said for transportation is this work is not just about providing the services and meeting the need but also how we can affect local policies, right? Transportation to medical um, services or appointments is a huge need that we see. But that same need that they have for medical appointments, they have it for transportation, for education, for access to food. 
So providing data that we collect to local elected officials to understand that they need to make changes in how monies are distributed is a key point on addressing social determinants of health. That's an excellent point. Like we're so focused on getting them to healthcare, but they need to get to the grocery store, to their jobs, and those things in order to make a change. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Are there any more questions? Well, I look forward to continuing these discussions. Like I said, um, we did not want this to be the month and then the awareness campaign is over. This will continue. We'll be working with Liliana and Becky Fogarty on work that they're going to be doing, um, engaging the uh, faculty, residents, and other staff members of the hospital around these issues. Please remember to fill out your CME uh, and evaluation from the presentation tonight, as well as to enter your words for our word cloud so that we can watch this visual representation of this project continue. Thank you.